Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, benedicta tu mulieribus, e benedictum fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et ad animotis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris e Filii e Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Carissimi, we love in Christ. Welcome to this broadcast Mass. And as we said on this, the fourth day in the octave of St. Lawrence, deacon and martyr of Rome. We also commemorate today Saints Hippolytus and Cassian, also martyrs. Of St. Hippolytus, the biography of this saint uh, has been greatly obscured by legend, which has made him a soldier and the prison warden of St. Lawrence, and also a martyr. But he was actually the disciple of St. Irenaeus. He was a priest and an illustrious teacher in the Roman Church. Later, sadly to say, he became the first anti-pope. Because of his rigorism, he became involved in a controversy with Pope Callistus, but atoned for this failing by martyrdom. He is the author of numerous works that attained popularity even in the Eastern Church. Happily, the schism did not last long. Together with Poncian, the rival pope, he was exiled to Death Island in Sardinia, where both died. The remains of Hippolytus were accorded a special burial place near that of St. Lawrence on the Tibertinian Way. Later, his body was transferred to the cloister of the Holy Redeemer upon the Letenian Hill near Rietzi. According to the tradition of St. Lawrence, Hippolytus was uh, the guard, his prison guard, whom, he, uh, whom the saint converted by, his, by the strength of his testimony. St. Cassian uh, at Imola, on this same day, the martyr Cassian underwent cruel torments. With hands bound behind his back, the judge delivered him over to his students to be pricked to pieces with iron styles. The small wounds from those little rascals lengthened his time of torment, but also made his own more glorious. He suffered during the persecution of Diocletian. Now forgive me for reading to you again today, but uh, the following uh, is a reflection that has been much on my mind, uh, not just in the last few days, but indeed over the past few months uh, and even years. Uh, and I'll explain more of that after I've read this to you. It may scandalise us moderns to learn that St. Hippolytus fell into a quarrel with the lawful Bishop of Rome. His contemporaries, however, did not judge him so harshly. Moreover, we may say with St. Augustine, branches too numerous or luxuriant upon the Christian tree, the heavenly surgeon cut off with a knife of martyrdom. Our interest in the liturgy makes since Hippolytus's book, The Apostolic Traditions, particularly precious because it shows the liturgical life of the Christian at Rome in the first centuries. In it, we find a description of the ancient mass with the oldest texts, also the prayers at baptism, as the agape, etc. What interests us most, however, is the liturgical life of the early Christians. We shall centre our attention upon three points, the Eucharist, the divine office, and the reading of scripture. Daily mass at that time was unknown, for only on Sundays was the holy sacrifice offered. The faithful took the consecrated bread home with them, and they were bidden to watch carefully that no one not of the faith eat of the Eucharist, or that a mouse or something else come upon it, or that part of it spoil. It is the body of Christ, the food of all the faithful, and it should never cause disgust. There was no difference then between ordinary bread and that set apart for the Eucharist. Meaning, of course, that uh, ordinary bread was used for both not suggesting that there, there was no change or anything uh, in the Eucharistic bread, because, of course, there was. The Christians were admonished to come often to church in order to be instructed in the Word of God. They should remember that they are hearing God speak, th speak through the instructor. The God-fearing Christian should feel that he is suffering a great loss if he does not go to the place where he will be taught the faith. And when an occasional speaker comes, let no one of you miss going to church. You will hear things of which you had never thought and benefit from that which the Holy Spirit gives you through the mouth of his preacher. 
Thus your faith will be strengthened through what you hear. Therefore, let everyone endeavour to go to church in that place where the Spirit is actually speaking. But if on some particular day there be no instructions, let everyone take up the Holy Scriptures at home and read such a portion as to him seems beneficial. That from chapter 32. Of special value are the admonitions given to the faithful on prayer. From these we see that the Christians of the first centuries observe hours of prayer almost as found at present in the divine office. Concerning prime, all the faithful men and women upon rising in the morning before beginning work should wash their hands and pray to God. Of terse, when you are at home, pray at the third hour and praise God. But if you are away when this hour comes, pray in your heart to God. For at this hour Christ was nailed to the cross at the hour of sex. In a similar way, you should pray again at the sixth hour, for at the time when Christ was nailed to the cross, there came a great darkness. Prayer should therefore be said in imitation of him who prayed at that hour, Christ before his death. And at noon, the ninth hour too should be made perfect by prayer and praise. In that hour, Christ was pierced by the spear. And at Vespers, once more, ought you to pray before you go to bed. About Matins, at midnight, rise from your bed, wash yourself and pray. If you have a wife, pray together in antiphonal fashion. If she is not yet of the faith, withdraw and pray alone, and return again to your place. If you are bound by the bond of marriage duties, do not cease your prayers, for you are not stained thereby. It is necessary that we pray at that hour, meaning Matins, for at that hour all creation is resting and praising God. Stars, trees, water are as if they were standing still. All the hosts of angels are holding divine services together with the souls of the just. They are praising Almighty God at that hour. What an inspiring passage. It reminds one perhaps of that holy and silent night when uh, the angels appeared to the shepherds in foretelling, uh, proclaiming the birth of the Saviour. At Lord's, in like manner rise and pray at the hour at which the cock crows. Full of hope, look forward to the day of eternal light that will shine upon us eternally after the resurrection from the dead. Motivation for these hours of prayer of the early Christians was the conviction that daily they were reliving Christ's death and resurrection. Every new day was a day of resurrection and daily they were raised with Christ on the cross. It is an example that should spur us on to give the Mass, the breviary and the Bible, the place of honour in our lives. Every day, those early Christians lived and breathed the death, life, passion, cross and resurrection of our Lord. Every day, remembering at those certain hours of the day, at six, at nine, at twelve, at three, at six, at nine, at midnight, having within their hearts, if not spoken by prayer, having within their hearts a commemoration, a remembrance of our Lord's passion and death and of his resurrection into new life, which of course gave them, as it gives us, new life as Christians. Now earlier in that uh, passage it said that uh, daily mass uh, was then unknown and that's not quite true as we know from the Acts of the Apostles where the uh, church described at Jerusalem uh, gathered daily to break bread and then to share a meal. We know that from the earliest times, the very earliest times, uh, daily mass uh, was 
uh, the, the practice. But however, then following, and remember Hippolytus is uh, writing around the beginning of the third century, intervening of which, of course, had been uh, periods of persecution when Christianity itself and the practice of it was outlawed. At this point, the Christians had long since left the synagogues or indeed been cast out of the synagogues, <clears throat> had ceased worshipping at the temple in Jerusalem and were now worshipping in each other's homes and gathering together at the weekend in the catacombs and the cemeteries, gathering on Saturday evening and hailing the Lord's Day of Sunday, the Day of Resurrection, uh, with uh, a dawn mass, having spent the night in prayer and praise in vigil, in listening to uh, the prophecies uh, from the Old Covenant and uh, the instructions of the Apostles from the New Covenant. Now there are of course some practicalities to consider if such a life were to be realised again for us as Christians. But I think the question we need to ask ourselves as Christians in this contemporary uh, situation is whether or not there is something we could learn from and indeed perhaps need to revive ourselves in order to improve the witness of Christ in our present age. For the truth is, my brothers and sisters, very sadly, that the concept of going to church more than once a week is something that most Christians find strange, think it weird to go to uh, church more than once a week. The concept of going to each other's houses and sharing meals on a regular basis, let alone on a daily basis, praying together and reading the scriptures together, again, is not something considered normal by most contemporary Christians. As anyone knows who has organised a house group, as anyone knows who has organised a potluck supper or anything of the like, it's very difficult for people, it's very difficult uh, for people to come. There's almost an expectation that people won't come to such events. And of course, we understand that the frenetic pace of society today, of, of our culture, of the way we live today, is such that in the first instance we are easy to excuse ourselves and others with almost whatever excuse comes. Oh, I have work the next day, or uh, oh, I'm very tired after a long day at work, or um, there are all sorts of um, I'm under all sorts of stress and anxiety at work, or uh, stress and anxiety at home, or uh, uh, there are issues I have to deal with, uh, etc. And we all nod our heads and say, of course, you know, I quite understand. Um, but yet surely, my brothers and sisters, as Christians, it's those times of stress and anxiety when we need the fellowship of our brothers and sisters in the faith, when we need to spend a little time out to reflect on the scriptures, when actually not having to worry about preparing a meal might be a good thing, and where certainly being embraced and upheld in prayer, being, to, being able to offload our stresses and anxieties, even if no solution may, may follow, just being able to share and discuss and to talk about them itself, as we know, often helps. St James in his epistle tells us, bear with one another's burdens. And so many of us think today in our contemporary situation that bearing with one another's burdens means bearing with the one who's a little bit odd at church, with old Mrs. So-and-so who, whose breath stinks and, and she always barges her way into the coffee queue first. 
People think that's what we mean by bearing with one another's burdens, but that's not what St. James was talking about. St. James was, was writing to a congregation who lived as a family, as a Christian family. Yeah, not all the time in one home, of course, but who gathered together on a frequent basis, who shared their lives together, just as we share our lives with our family and friends. So Christians in the early centuries shared their lives with each other. They were truly brothers and sisters in Christ. They were truly friends. Their social circle was their congregation. And of course, they would still have uh, and maintain friendships and relationships with those who weren't Christians even as St. Hippolytus refers to there, even marrying them. But even so, uh, they would, of course, by their life and witness, and clearly they must have done in order for the church to grow, brought others from outside the church into the church. People from the places where they worked, their friends, their work colleagues, their neighbours, Clearly they must have done, otherwise the church wouldn't have grown. It is, my brothers and sisters, shocking sometimes to realise uh, how poor the state of the church is in the 21st century. I'm not talking about institution, I'm not talking about the, the, uh, the, the lack of, of money and riches. But the lack of this kind of Christian life, of this kind of Christian witness. Now there are, of course, uh, some churches, some congregations that do manifest this. But the majority, the vast majority of most Christians' experience of church today is something that occurs once a week. And some even begrudge that. If the church is to be an effective witness into the 21st century, if the church is to grow in this current age, then I think we need a revival. A revival of the church, a revival of personal holiness first. Of getting back into this discipline of, of praying through the day. Generally today, of course, we think, oh, well, it's only the clergy. It's only monks and nuns that have to pray all through the day at different times of the day. And yet clearly, in Hippolytus' day even, in the third century, ordinary Christians, ordinary members of the congregation, in their own day-to-day -day lives, would at these various hours of the day, pause for a moment's reflection and prayer. So in the first instance, a revival needs a revival in personal holiness, in personal spirituality, in the development of a prayer life. If anyone has ever received spiritual direction, nearly always one of the things a director will ask about is a rule of life. And again, we think, oh, a rule of life is something that monks and nuns have. A rule of life is something that every Christian should have. And by it, we mean uh, a system uh, that we try to abide to of uh, not just a, an orarium, not just a schedule of when I will say prayers, but of a commitment and a promise to do so. Of a commitment and a promise to oneself. To spend time in prayer, to spend time reading the scriptures and to reflect on them. A rule of life, a personal rule of life, is something that every Christian should have. And it's just a structure 
It can be very loose, but it's just a structure upon which to hang, as it were, one's spirituality, to grow and develop one's spirituality. And what's the purpose of all that? But of course to become closer to Christ. There's nothing negative about it. We always, of course, that rebellious instinct within us recoils at the word rule. And yet a rule of life for a Christian simply is a means, a structured way of becoming and growing closer to Jesus. Of experiencing communion with God on a daily basis. And as I preached a couple of weeks ago, we're fortunate that still in many places we have the opportunity to go to daily Mass to receive our daily substantial bread, as the Paternoster says, to receive that heavenly manna, that bread of life that promises us eternal life, that nourishes us, that strengthens us, and enables us at the moment of its reception to commune with God in a tangible way. As I said then, and I'll say again now, those who can, should and must try to support the daily mass wherever they are. And avail themselves of that opportunity to commune with God in a tangible way, on a frequent basis. It's not going to do anyone harm, is it, to receive the Blessed Sacrament, to be at one with God in Jesus. Always, my brothers and sisters, I bang on every day, I know, about sacrifice and living sacrificially. But that is what the Christian life is about. Sacrificing our time, sacrificing our will, sacrificing our thoughts for God's thoughts, for God's will, for God's purpose for our lives. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it meant to be a Christian in the first century, what it meant to be a Christian in the third century, and what it means to be a Christian now. We shouldn't be reading the life described in the New Testament, in the epistles and in the Acts, as just historical documents. But we should be ourselves living so as to experience the same need and necessity for the lessons that are being given by the apostles in those letters. So that bearing with one another's burdens doesn't mean putting up with some weirdo in our view or perspective or appreciation on a Sunday morning. It means knowing and appreciating and bearing with why they're a little bit odd compared to others. It will mean knowing where they live, knowing something about the circumstances of their life, knowing something about the story of their life or the story of their faith. And then in loving them, because we know them and can appreciate them. Then loving them as a brother and sister in Christ and helping them. There is much, my brothers and sisters, that each of us, and I put my hand up and admit that I too, have those same faults and failings and weaknesses. I too make those little judgments. But it would be lovely to after Mass go and have breakfast and talk about it all. 
it would be lovely to go for a coffee and share my concerns and frustrations and anxieties or to share intentions for prayers to work out a solution <clears throat> for somebody's problem and surely I'm not alone in thinking or desiring that and it seems to me my brothers and sisters that all it takes is for a few of us to make a start and to actually do it. To actually live it. In our own small way here, we, we, we do that. We try that. We have daily Mass. At least twice a week, uh, we go after Mass for breakfast. And we do. We share, we talk about our, our, our issues, about our problems. We sometimes share knowledge about others' issues and problems so we can form prayer intentions. We talk about the faith, we talk about the scripture readings, we talk about the homily even sometimes. <laughs> Imagine if this was a thing that all Christians did in every town and city and village, in every parish, in every congregation. There's much here, my brothers and sisters, for us to think about and to dwell upon. But this is what the scripture is telling us. You see, the scripture would be relevant if we lived the lives that were relevant to it. And it should be, my brothers and sisters, that our lives are informed and inspired and motivated by Scripture, not the other way around. So often we approach Scripture to today trying to justify what we already are doing instead of going to Scripture to learn how we should be living and what we should be doing. Believe me when I tell you this, a grain of wheat must fall into the ground and die, or else it remains nothing more than a grain of wheat. Our Lord is referring to ourselves. Unless we as individuals, for his sake, who bear his name, are prepared to die to self on a daily basis, like the wheat of, like this grain of wheat, then we are not going to be able to grow and develop into the saints that he is calling us to be. If we're not prepared to deny ourselves, then we are not going to grow. Let us, my brothers and sisters, think and reflect about our lives as Christians. Think and reflect upon the sorry state of the church today. And let us think how we might together reboot the church in the 21st century. so that our lives become once more relevant to the divine revelation in Christ, in his holy word, and in those faithful and salvation-giving traditions that once expressed the life of the church. In the name of God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost.
em nome do seu bispo e com espírito altivo. Glória a Deus. Confesso e pouco e fruto em conspeito, mas o sanctidade, a magnificência e o sanctificado, Senhor, minha Deus. 